I look forward to the month of May because that always to me means the Charleston Festival. Place of great cultural interest and very beautiful. Hello and thank you for joining us for this event, part of Charleston Festival at Home. Today's session is all about houses and the families who make their homes and stories in them. This is the Charleston Dining Room and you can just imagine the debates that took place around this, Vanessa Bell's Painted Table. Charleston Festival at Home is our attempt to keep the spirit of those Bloomsbury conversations alive and I hope that if you've enjoyed the session so far, you'll consider making a donation to the Charleston Emergency Appeal. But now let's keep talking with this conversation between Julian Fellows and Hannah Rothschild, Bricks and Mortar, chaired by author, producer and historian Rebecca Radil. Really thrilled to be here today to talk to um, two amazing authors and writers about um, what bricks and mortar mean to us. And I think during these times of lockdown, we're becoming increasingly more aware of space and how much space we have and what we can do with the space that we have and you know our outdoor space and that kind of thing. So just as a as a way of an introduction, um, joining this session um, on bricks and mortar, we have Hannah Rothschild, who is a filmmaker. Um, the first female to chair the board of trustees at the National Gallery and also an author um, and the author of The House of Trelawney, which we'll be talking about a little bit today. We're also joined today by Julian Fellows, who is an Academy Award winning director, screenwriter, um, creator of the global phenomenon, Downton Abbey, um, and also in his spare time, a novelist as well. Um, so thank you for joining me today, both of you. Um, first of all, I just wanted to ask, um, perhaps Hannah first, how, how are you feeling in, in lockdown, in the space that you have? It changes day by day. Uh, some days I think this is literally heaven for a writer, because as you know, we quite like and need solitude. And then other days I miss um, my friends, extended members of my family, restaurants, you know, <laughs> museums, and think I'm going to climb up a wall. But I'm lucky, I'm in the country, I've got lots of space, um, and I've got a few people who are close to me around me. So I think, you know, by and large, I'm doing well. And, and Julian, how are you coping? Well, I agree. I mean, I think um, those of us who are lucky enough to be in the country with space in the house and also uh, large outside spaces where we can go uh, are among the fortunate. I mean, it's a time for kind of rethinking and rather wondering about some elements of one's life, I think. Uh, but on the whole, I've rather enjoyed it. Actually, although I completely agree with Hannah about solitude for working and all the rest of it, I think my only complaint is that I find it quite hard to work. I just sort of want to lie about really and drink and eat and generally sort of snooze my way through the whole of lockdown. Uh, but I am having to drive myself back to my desk now. Uh, but I mean, I don't think we have much to complain about. My thoughts are always with families with young children in high rise flats and all the rest of it. Uh, and so I don't think we have the right to complain really. No, I, I, I quite agree. And I think we'll, we'll go, we, we only have a short um, amount of time here today. So what I want to go straight into, because obviously this talk um, is about stately homes, big houses and the spaces and the histories and the stories that they engender. Um, and I just wondered, first of all, as a first question, what your, I mean, when I was a young child, my first experience of a stately home was going to the Grosvenor Estate in Chester in my dad's bashed up Hugo to go and pick my mum up who was a waitress and I remember seeing this house and thinking goodness me people actually live in places like this 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 isn't you know part of the past but I wondered what your first experiences of 
you know, your first experience of a grand stately home um, was? And perhaps, Julian, if I start with you. Um, the first, I can't really remember which is the first great house I ever went to, but uh, the first one I loved was a house in uh, the North Riding called Bruff Hall. Uh, and it was quite near um, the race course, you know, um, Catrick, whatever it is. Uh, and uh, I went there because some great friend of my parents was the cousin or sister or something of the owner. Uh, and he was a chap called Lawson, Sir Rafe Lawson, uh, and his wife, Pommy. And they became my home from home. When I was at Ampleforth, you wanted to have a local house you could go to for lunch or for the day or whatever. And because my parents lived in Sussex, they were no use to me at all. And Bruff became my kind of escape place. Uh, and um, I remember it very well to this day. Now I'm sad to say uh, the family's moved out and it's been divided into flats. But uh, in those days, I remember going there and after I left school, I used to go back and stay. Uh, and they were a wonderful family. I mean, fairly eccentric. I always remember the postman came one day and needed a signature. And I was leading her up the staircase because Rafe was in bed with flu. Uh, and his wife came out of the door and said, said, who is this? And I said, oh, it's the postman. Uh, he needs a signature. And she said, would he like to stay the night? And that was really, uh, how they were. But uh, that was a lovely introduction to a lovely way of life, a way of life, of course, in the 60s that was in decline. But nevertheless, I was glad I saw the end of it, really. Well, not even the end, but I saw it. Mm -hmm. And Hannah? Mm. I, well, I think my first really big house that I went to on my own without my parents was my great aunt Miriam's house, which was uh, near Peterborough. And she had let it go, as they say, partly because she couldn't really be bothered with interior decoration and partly because she thought it would be a, a better surroundings for the animals and insects that she liked to live with. So there was a fox who had free range. There was also an owl. Um, she was known as Queen of the Fleas and was a great um, you know, experimenter and recorder of the natural life of fleas. So they lived in plastic bags on every single surface. Um, there were mice ran over the kitchen table and the dining room table and there was one rather old retainer, poor lady, who had to kind of get from the kitchen, which seemed to be several miles away from the dining room, with a plate of food and by the time it arrived it was stone cold. Um, and I, I was pretty terrified, both of my great aunt and of this cavernous house, I might say. Um, so I think that that's, that was my first memory. And then when I was, when I was a girl, and actually I re-watched Gosford Park, um, which I have to say was incredibly enjoyable third time round. But I do remember going to house parties uh, when I was young, and you would be billeted in a, a grand house for this party. And it was exactly as um, Julian, you had in Gosford Park. The ladies would be sent out the moment that the last course had finished, so the men could smoke cigars and have port and you'd be sent to powder your nose. And very often you would have to run from the dining room to the sitting room because they could only afford to heat those two big rooms. And it was Arctic even in July, frankly. Um, so I have, you know, my, my, my knowledge of these houses is of old customs being maintained, but in rapidly declining circumstances. I think one has to remember that we were the generation that saw them at their most uncomfortable. <laughs> because the Edwardians and people that had fires in the passages and in the halls and everything, then all, they all left after the Second World War. And, and the sort of very rich Arabs and Russians hadn't started buying them until 20 years later. So we were there in these disintegrating houses in our sort of general kind of evening clothes and everything else, but scooting along to get away from the cold. And you turned the tap and a bit of sort of brown juice would trickle out that was stone cold. I mean, that was really their nadir, uh, if we but knew it. And some yes. of I remember one, one house I stayed in where I was, the bedroom was on the first floor and there were two floors above that. It sounds very ungrateful to tell these stories, but that, at least, you know, you'll get an idea. And there were buckets all over the floor of my bedroom. And I thought, oh, it must be modern art installation. Because I couldn't imagine why else you'd have buckets on the floor. And then in the middle of the night, it started to rain. And the rain came from the roof through the third floor, through the second floor, into the bedroom that I was sleeping in. Drip, drip, drip. I mean, 
And you're right. I mean, we did, we caught the, the very tail end. I don't know if anyone lives, I suspect at Chatsworth they maintain standards. I think they do actually, but I don't think there are many houses which do. Well, I think there are more now, funnily enough, than when we were in our teens. Um, really? So, I've, yes, I've because, stopped getting invitations now. You know, Your the houses business. have recovered their value again now. I mean, they now go for millions of pounds. Whereas, you remember that famous thing uh, back in the 60s when they tried to sell one of the Dukeries, I forget which it was, I think it was Thorsby, and they tried to sell it to the local council for one pound and the council turned it down. I mean, that's how bad things were, really. Well, they couldn't give Wentworth Woodhouse away, could they? That was a, another incredible house that I think they tried to sell that for £20 or something. Of do, course, do some think... houses were always comfortable. And I should think Wadston is probably top of that particular list. Um, oh, yeah. Wadston's yeah, well. Wadston super comfortable, but nobody, nobody stays in it anymore, unfortunately. Um, so it's really, it re is now just a museum. But yes, I'm sure it was heated to a kind of, you know, a kind of tropical degree, I imagine, by my relations. <laughs> Do you think there's a space um, in the 21st century for these stately homes? Do you think that they should be extant still um, in the ways that they are? Or do you think we should be moving more towards having them, the ones that are still in family um, um, possession owned by perhaps the National Trust? Do you think that, that they should be existing um, today still? I don't quite understand. Do you mean the National Trust houses should exist or the non or the kind of and, private owned ones? I mean, in the 21st century, obviously, mm. you know, we we're living in a world where class barriers are very different to how they were even you know 50 years ago or 100 years ago do you think there's a space for these houses being owned by private families still or do you think we should be having conversations about ownership and and, and that kind of thing julian do you want to have a first stab at that one well, I, I mean, I think that uh, the media seems to have so much difficulty grasping that we live in a capitalist society. And a capitalist society brings certain freedoms, but also certain inequities. That is part of it. If you wish to live in a communistical society, uh, then obviously there would, they, none of them would be privately owned and only the best would be maintained on public money. And others would either find different reasons to live or would be demolished. But that isn't the society we're in. We have a great variety. I mean, certainly half the houses that you would call a stately home would go for less money than a modern flat in the city of London. So, uh, you know, I don't really know what the question is you're asking. If people have got these houses and they have enough money to run them, good luck to them, say I. Uh, and if they don't want to run them, then get rid of them. You know, uh, uh, I don't really see it as needing an absolute rule like that. Okay, and Hannah, do you have any thoughts on, on that area? Well, I think if you think, you know, that since, uh, since World War I, over 1,500 great British houses have been allowed to fall down and disappear because families couldn't afford to keep them up. I think that's a great loss for the country, personally. Now, the National Trust has taken on a lot of houses, but now, incidentally, it won't take a new house on unless it comes with a large uh, stipend to support it. And if you look at how many people, I think the National Trust has six million visitors now. So if you think that six million people love visiting those houses and love seeing them, that actually, I think there's a really, you know, we are a heritage nation, whether we like it or not. We're really good at it. We built these extraordinary houses, and if they have to survive through private ownership, that's one thing. If people can trot around them, you know, as members of the National Trust or historic houses, that's another thing. I don't think that really matters. I think that what does matter is that we preserve them as much as possible. Mm, well, I, I, I agree about the, the preservation. I think the other question I wanted to um, ask both of you was this idea of history and the way that buildings and bricks and mortar can retain almost the ghosts of the past. Um, and I, I remember from my, my childhood home, which, um, um, you know, when you're walking down the steps, it was only built in the 19th century, a little terrace, but you walk down the steps in, the ha in my childhood home and there was a creek at a certain point. And I always used to think, when did that start creaking? Why is that particular step weaker? And I just wondered about your whether you've had any feelings like this about about 
spaces in historic buildings where the weight of the past and history is very present to you. Perhaps, Hannah, if I start with you. Mm. Yeah, I, I think houses are characters, and certainly in um, the novel I just written, House of Trelawney, the, the castle itself, Trelawney, is a character. It's a, as a bigger character as any of the physical living people. Um, and that's partly because, as you say, it's imbued many generations and centuries of memories and people running up and down its floorboards or building onto it. And it's partly, I think, because houses, as you say, the creak on the step, you know, you lie in bed at night and the pipes gurgle, or, you know, if you're unlucky, the slurry tank plops, um, or the wind whistles through the rooftop. So they feel, I think, very physical at times. And I do think um, that there is that there is a case to be made that they they do, you know, centuries and centuries of being lived in rubs off somehow on their fabric. I like to think that anyway. Yeah, and Julian? Yes, I mean, this touches on a sort of central dichotomy about these houses, that in our, in our imaginations, in one way, they are enviable, beautiful, the centre of British heritage and whatever. Uh, but in another way, they are a sort of burden, uh, a monster, a tyrant that strangles the life out of families. And it's explored constantly both sides of it in our literature. So on one side, you get a Thornfield Hall in Jane Eyre or a more populist Manderley in Rebecca, where the house actually becomes a kind of a tyrant, a ruler, uh, and eventually it is defeated by being burnt in both those books and then Max de Winter or Mr. Rochester are free and, uh, and they can get on with their own lives and their own wives. Uh, and I think that is quite an interesting aspect that even uh, an ordinary upper class family today who in most though not all cases have lost their family seat and it's moved on, they, they have a very mixed emotion about that in one way it's sad, it's gone, there was a tradition and oh dear. And in another, they are free to get on with their lives as they would like to do, as opposed to having one of these houses round their neck. I mean, I've known people who were really keen on this particular career or something in the arts or whatever it was, and once they inherit the family palazzo, that's just out of the question. It's not going to happen. Uh, and they have to accept that their own private wishes are going to be second in this particular contest. Uh, and so I think there's a sort of sour taste in our love of all these things. Uh, and I think, I can't remember who said it, but one writer said, I had rather live in a cottage with the view of Warwick Castle than have the burden of Warwick Castle and look out at my cottage. <laughs> and and uh, I sort of quite understand that. And I think that is explored in books. Well, I mean, I think the House of Trelawney explores that element as well, that in, in one way it's enviable, but in another way it's not. Uh, and, and that is part of the tradition, which makes it interesting, I think. Well, well, perhaps now is the time, um, Hannah, if, you, if you're um, happy to do so, you're going to give a, a short reading from, from your new book, um, which is available sure. by now um, through online retailers, I should say. So um, if you could do that, that would be wonderful. Sure. Um, so I'm going to pick up the story um, uh, where this is the, the, elderly, the elderly incumbents, the most elderly incumbents. It's a whole family living in one castle, but these are the elderly incumbents. On the ground floor, in another part of the castle, known as the Mistress's Wing, Enion and Clarissa, the Earl and Countess of Trelawney, sat side by side on a small sofa in front of a four-bar electric fire. Even in June, the room was cold, and Clarissa had flung a fur coat over a tweed skirt and twin set. Her husband wore a corduroy suit with leather patches at the elbow, buttoned up over a thick woolen sweater and two scarves. Above the fire, there was a mantelpiece with a clock and a family portrait of an ancestor. On the lintel, there were rows of stiff, wildly out-of-date invitations, as well as some Christmas cards. A side table was piled with books and papers and a small television box set. Sherry and gin in cut glass decanters, and in another corner, there was a roll-top desk over which there were more family portraits. The windows were framed by green velvet curtains, one ripped, one intact, both faded brown by sunlight on the inner edges. The well-trodden Turkish carpet had been worn through in certain places, and there was a dog basket, 
for a long departed canine friend. I will redo my will tomorrow, Enyan said. Have your thoughts changed since yesterday? Clarissa asked, not unkindly. I'm going to lead the Gainsborough to Bella. Who's Bella? She didn't remind her husband that the Gainsboroughs had been sold a long time ago. My granddaughter, you silly old bat. Honestly, Clarissa, I do wonder about you. You don't have a granddaughter called Bella, the Countess said. Ambrose, Toby and Arabella. Well, who the devil is Bella? The Earl said crossly. Well, come to think of it, it might be Arabella. Ah, there's life in the old boy yet. And Enyan slapped his thigh. Clarissa was 80. Her husband was 85. And today his wrinkled face and gizzardy neck stuck out of a collar many sizes too large, making him look like an old tortoise. In his youth, he'd been a towering man with a neck as thick as a telegraph pole who thought nothing of lifting up a small heifer and could exhaust three fresh horses on a day's hunting. His roar of laughter or shout of displeasure could be heard half a mile away. During their long marriage, the Earl had been constitutionally, almost pathologically unfaithful. Nevertheless, his wife, determined to turn a blind eye, counted their marriage as uncommonly happy and content, and now looking at the beloved, shrunken, desiccated version of his former self, she knew she'd been right to disregard the peccadilloes, and how lucky for her that she'd been born without any romantic aspirations. Is the yard arm in the right place? Enyan asked. It's five o'clock, one hour to go. Well, can't we pretend it's six? Standards, darling, standards. The cold wrapped itself around their old bones so viciously that neither could move. Is it just me or is time going very slowly today? Enyan asked. Maybe a little slower, Clarissa had to admit. Maybe a little. Well, that's, that's that's wonderful and this is one of the things when you ha when we're doing a virtual event that should have had a round of applause because it's a, a really lovely extract and one of the things I really, really enjoyed about your book was um and it was unexpected was how witty it, it is it's a, it's, a, it's a story about a family and you know the challenges they go through but also there's so much humor there and um yeah I, I really enjoyed reading it and um, Julian and um, mo moving on to your um, illustrious career now I would have thought probably back when um, Gosford Park came out and you won the Academy Award, that for any filmmaker and director, that would feel like the pinnacle. But then TV and the viewing, the way we view things changed and you had this phenomenon, which was Downton Abbey. And what that does so well, um, and you know, it's an addictive, it's addictive viewing, it's almost a soap opera. You, you kind of show the symbiotic nature of these households so you see what's going on downstairs you see what's what's going on upstairs you see how everybody works together from a writing point of view I'm curious to know how much or how you approached the topic how it kind of got got off the ground and um, and how you researched the various roles and um, went about creating this world well uh, um, I was very lucky because Gareth Neem the producer uh, came to me with the idea that it was uh, time for another kind of drama about uh, a family uh, and this time it would be in the country not in London uh, and so on. So to that, that extent it was kind of presented to me. Um, I've always been very interested in that way of life and again it slightly goes back to what Hannah was saying that when we were young we saw the end of what it had been before the war and you would sort of, I remember once I was having tea with a great aunt and I said why are there so many different shapes of teaspoon? And she said, because they aren't all teaspoons. They're melon spoons and egg spoons and all of these distinctions that have now almost faded away. And we saw the last traces of it. And so I was very, very lucky that I got interested when I was very young and they were all still alive. And so I could talk to them about what life had been like. You know, she was my eldest great aunt was presented in 1898 and married in 1903. And I knew her perfectly well. She only died when I was 21. Uh, and, and all of that went into uh, Gosford first and then the rather lighter and sunnier climbs of Downton Abbey. Uh, and, and a lot of it was sort of stories remembered from that and based on it. But I think where we were, again, very fortunate 
is we seem to hit the right tone for the modern audience. If the show had been made in the 50s, all the family would have been gracious and charming and all the servants would have been funny. If, if the show had been made in the 90s, all the family would have been venal and immoral and disgusting and all the servants would have been downtrodden and oppressed. But we didn't do either of those. We just did a group of people who obviously had been born to different fortunes, but on the whole, a group of people doing their best uh, and, and trying to get through it like we all are. And that seemed to be the right way to have an upstairs, downstairs drama for now, as opposed to for 20 years ago. Uh, and, and again, one would always like to praise one's judgment, but so much of judgment is luck, uh, and you, because you either could do this or you could do that. Uh, and I think in that one, we just seem to have got it right. And it's obviously, as, you've, as we've mentioned, it's not your first foray into writing about um, grand stately homes. And you have a reading that you're going to do during the session from your book, Past Imperfect. I wonder if you'd um, be happy to do that now? In this reading, um, the uh, narrator, who doesn't have a name, has come back to Gresham Abbey in 2008 because I wrote the book when I realised it was exactly 40 years after I had been what they used to disparagingly call a Deb's delight. <laughs> uh, and uh, in the book, he goes to see some, for reasons I won't bore you with plot reasons, he goes to see some of the girls he knew then, who now, of course, are women in late middle age. Uh, and in this instance, he, he has been in love with a girl called Serena Gresham, completely unsuccessfully, uh, for more or less his whole life. And uh, a chance, takes him back to the house, which he was not expecting. And he is there again for the first time in almost 40 years. The tapestry drawing room was on the corner of the garden front. And the easiest way to reach it was through an oval anteroom at the back of the hall, where facing doors led left to the dining room and right to our destination. It was a lovely place. The walls were lined in a kind of dusty blue moire with cream panelling edged in gilt up to the dado and high panel door cases with overdoor paintings set into them, taking the cream and gilt on up to the ceiling. Against the huge spaces of blue hung a set of Gobelin tapestries celebrating a series of victories achieved, I am pretty sure, by Marlborough. I forget precisely why they were here. Maybe an earlier Claremont had been in part responsible for the great Duke's glory. In fact, now I'm writing it. I think that was why they were up to an earldom in the 1710s. Beneath our feet was a ravishing Aubusson carpet with its slight distinctive wrinkling and on it sat various magnificent pieces of furniture. Most spectacularly, a pedestal clock, seven foot high on its plinth, its inlaid case embellished with gilding, which had been presented to the third earl by the Empress Catherine of Russia in return for some unspecified personal service, which no one had ever convincingly explained. There you are. We couldn't believe our eyes when we saw you. Lady Claremont kissed me swiftly and efficiently on one cheek. Not for her the double kiss import of the 1970s. You should have let us know you were coming. I presented my party who all shook hands. Jennifer alone thanked her for inviting us and Tarquin tried to start a conversation about the famous clock on which, needless to say, he had a great deal of information at his fingertips. But she had spent a life avoiding just such overtures and soon gave a nod and a smile to indicate she'd heard enough. Then she turned to her ancient neighbor, introducing me. Do you remember Mrs. Davenport? Since the woman did look a bit familiar, I nodded as I shook her wizened hand. He was here all the time at the end of the 60s, Lady Claremont explained with a gay laugh. We used to feel terribly sorry for him. She looked at me indulgently and I could sense my throat tightening at the prospect of what was coming next. But nothing could stop her as she looked about to gain the maximum audience. He was so in love with Serena. And she and the said Mrs. Davenport laughed happily together at the memory of my roiling misery, which could still keep me awake at nights and which I had thought private 
and brilliantly concealed from all but me. I smiled by way of response to show I too thought it a terrific joke that I had wandered through these same charming rooms with my heart actually hurting in my chest. But her steady, even voice served to calm my remembered pain as she chatted on about this and that. Serena and the other children, the lovely weather, the ghastly government, all standard stuff for a drinks party at an English country house. That was lovely. That was really, really nice. And again, I wish that we could have a, a round of applause. So here's a virtual one. <laughs> and, but what I, what I love again is the, the wit. There's, there's always seemed to be, it seems to be part of the genre, doesn't it? A, a wittiness to um, um, the uh, stories of aristocrats living in these, these grand houses. And um, one question I wanted to ask before I move on to just asking you about the writing process a little bit more. You mentioned it in um, your reading about how houses can kind of gather lots of different accoutrements and um, bits and pieces that have got their own, you know, wide histories. Do you think as a society, um, and I'll come to Hannah first with this question, do you think as a society we are doing enough to recognise the colonial histories of these big houses and how things like the slave trade have fed into the, the funds that have been used to build you know, the, the actual bricks and mortar of these buildings? I, I suspect, um, and um, that the slave trade is only one of the really unpleasant uh, sources of, of, of income that some of the families might have relied on, quite honestly. I mean, it, it, I'm not, I'm not going to rate how awful awfulnesses are, but yeah. you know, slaves are obviously one of them. And then you've got war and pillage um, and, and, you know, financial skullduggery. So I think it's, it would be problematic just to say, right, it's, it's, you know, you go to a big house and think slave trade. I think you can go to a big house and think, you know, where did it come from? Um, and, and that's obviously, I'm not trying to duck a question or a moral issue, but, but that's unfortunately, you know, where there is money, there is often something not so pleasant behind it. Now, should you therefore raise a house that was built on the slave trade or on the spoils of war? I personally, I don't think so, any more than I think you should destroy a painting in the National Gallery because it was owned by a slave trader. Uh, should one be aware that a lot of these places and objects have very complicated provenances and history? Yes, absolutely. Um, but I don't think it diminishes um, from their value. I think it's just something, you know, one has to take on board and be conscious of, but, but not necessarily judge an object for that. You can judge the people whose ill-gotten gains or whatever, uh, um, insalubrious, you know, whatever. But I don't think you can judge the objects. I think one has to differentiate between those two things. I don't know if yeah. Julian would agree. Yeah, what, what do you think, Julian? Uh, well, at the moment, there is a kind of um, desire to rather, uh, I think, blacken uh, the sources of money on which these houses were built. Uh, of course, the slave trade is extremely unpleasant uh, and was part of the economy, but only part. I mean, it was never as important to the economy as it was in America, for instance. Uh, and and um, I agree completely with Hannah that we shouldn't uh, burn a painting because it was bought or commissioned by money that we would rather not think about. Uh, but there were also, you know, marriages. Marriage was practically an industry for the upper classes, uh, and particularly the British, who didn't have this fixation of marrying the same rank. If you were German, you wanted to marry someone with the same number of quarterings and all this stuff. If you were British, you wanted to marry someone with jolly good money bags or good looking. So, you know, nobody has got 16 quarterings or whatever it was uh, that the Germans like in this country because we were much more variegated. Bankers' daughters could become duchesses quite as easily as the daughters of another duke. Uh, and I think that kept it sort of fresh in a way and with a, a kind of turnover uh, of not being too fixed in our class system. Uh, but you know, there were sources of wealth that were legitimate, the expansion of towns, industry, uh, trading, all of these things, which built many of our houses, uh, which none of us would object to now as they created a lot of employment and so on. Uh, I, I just think one mustn't get too led into the dark side over all of these things. Uh, there are aspects of earlier societies 
that we don't approve of and we don't like. And no doubt there will be aspects of our society that future generations disapprove of and don't like. And that's how it is. People change and we change with it, you know. So I, I don't think, I think it's a bit of a side issue that, if I'm absolutely honest. Okay, well, the, one of the things that um, is happening at the moment, there's a project called the Colonial Country, Countryside Project, which is actually bringing out these histories from historic houses. So if anyone is interested in looking into that a little bit more, that's um, one place to have to have a look at um, those histories. But moving on to um, Charleston House, which is obviously, you know, this is where, you know, the Literary Festival would have been taking place had not the virus happened. Um, that has its own rich history as well. And I'm going to be a huge cliche here and um, link um, from Vanessa Bell to Virginia Woolf and her famous quote with um, a room of one's own. So I wonder about the writing process with, with both of you. What's your ideal um, setup? Perhaps Julian first. What's your ideal setup for, for writing and, and getting the creative juices flowing? My first real writing room was in a house we had in London at the time. And it was so small. It was just a desk and me and two bookcases and that was it and you could just about get the door shut uh, but I was comforted in this by reading somewhere that someone said great thoughts are born in small rooms so uh, I held on to that but I mean mainly I like to get away from people you know how you read about people writing at the kitchen table and children are screaming and dogs are fighting and the telephones going and the televisions blaring out that's not for me I can't do that. I have to get away and be alone and be quiet. Uh, and of course, in a way, as Hannah was saying earlier, lockdown rather plays into that as there's no dropping by these days. Uh, and, and, and I think I do need a sort of time when I sit down. I always try and, and leave off the work the day before, knowing what the first bit is the next day so that at least I will get started. Even if it doesn't go on very long, I will get started. And I have to sit down and sort of get myself into the moment and then begin and see if it keeps going. Okay, so you leave yourself with a bit of a cliffhanger then. Do you do the same, Hannah? Is that your writing uh, process? My, well, my writing process is slightly different to Julian's in that um, I came to writing a bit later in life. Uh, I, you know, I've been a filmmaker and and now actually I work in our family businesses. So when I finally got the confidence up to actually sit down and write something long form as opposed to journalist pieces or, you know, um, the odd script, which was never made instantly. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I then decided I was going to treat like, writing rather like an illicit love affair, which, uh, so I used to take it to, you know, I, I took it to a hotel for a weekend. I took it on <laughs> holiday. I set my alarm clock in the middle of the night in order to go and meet it, you know, somewhere else in the house. So it's rather an eccentric way of doing it. But for me, it keeps the kind of romance alive. But I rather suspect that Julian is a proper writer and I am, you know, slightly, you know, I, I, I rather feel I'm rather an improper writer, you know, for that reason. I think we're all improper writers. <laughs> I'm sure that the only people who think they're proper writers are writing something no one wants to read. <laughs> I think you might be right there actually. <laughs> um, so um, what's, I guess one of them, as we're drawing towards the end of this conversation, I want to ask you both a twofold question. Um, and the first part of this is, um, do you have a favorite character? And if so, why? So Hannah. Well, in any, in well, any, in any book at any time, anywhere. Well, I was going to ask actually of your own characters, but yes, we can widen it, we can broaden it if you like. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I think in uh, I think in in literature, I'm particularly fond of, of um, Linda from The Pursuit of Love, Nancy Mitford's um, real, I mean, I think masterpiece. Um, and I love the fact that Linda is a slave to her emotions um, and constantly veering off in different directions. Um, and I love her fierceness and her honesty and I love the fact she doesn't give two hoots uh, about convention or what she should do. So she's somebody, I wish I was a bit more like her, I think. Um, and in the things that I've written, I, I have a fondness, I wrote, um, it sounds completely daft, but I hope, I think it does work, I hope it works. Um, in my last book called The Improbability of Love, I wrote about a picture that talks 
because I'd always been kind of walked around art galleries by my father. And uh, when I was a little girl, I used to think, I wish they could damn well speak these inanimate things hanging on the walls. So when I got older, I thought, right, well, I'm going to make them. So this picture talks and it tells you about its history and about its past. And um, it was just really, it was really fun to write. So I think that's why I like that. Oh, that's good. That's good. And Julian, I have to um, kind of butt in slightly here and tell you that my favourite character of yours is Daisy in Downton. But who's your favourite character? <laughs> <laughs> well, I never do the Downton people because they're all my children. I love them all. <laughs> Um, and I want them all to be happy. Uh, but um, I don't know, it's hard for me to find a character. I mean, Becky Sharp is quite high on my list uh, for many of the same reasons that Hannah's just given about Linda. Um, I, I like her because in the end, you understand why she's doing it all. You don't, you don't hate her for wanting what she wants. Uh, and I think that's quite an achievement. My main sort of character I keep reading about all uh, over and over and over again is Napoleon. But that's a slightly different category. That's a real person. Uh, but I, I love Napoleon. And I've got a book here uh, that was written by the Duke of Vicenza, who was a, one of his generals who, when he abandoned the army in Russia, because he'd heard there was a rebellion in Paris, he got into this coach, or first of all, a sleigh and then a coach, and just went for Paris, hell for leather with this one guy. And, and Vicenza was so, so amazed to be in this position that every time they stopped to have something to eat or go to the loo or whatever it was, he would write down their conversation. So that in fact, the book is a kind of four or five day interview with Napoleon. Uh, and it was suppressed, uh, not very much later in the 19th century because he's very, very rude about the Duke and Duchess of Bassano. And because the Vicenzas and the Bassanos intermarried later, the book was suppressed. And so it's quite rare to have a copy of this in English. And that's when I go back and back and back to. But of my own characters, I have a sort of soft spot for Lady Upfield in Snobs, who's <laughs> really based on one of my sort of early patrons, early believers. When you try to make a career in the arts on any level at all, um, one of the things is rather like Tinkerbell. You, you, you need people to believe in you before you sort of exist at all. And she was one of the first, based on the, a woman who was one of the first people really to believe in me, that I might actually get something done. Uh, and uh, that is very dear to you, actually. And although she also is quite a distinctive character. I mean, I won't spoil it for anyone who wants to read the book. But um, nevertheless, I do love her. I, I, I have a real kind of grateful love for believing in me when no one else did. Well, that's, lo that's lovely. And I think these voices, they do stay with you. I mean, I primarily um, write non-fiction and unfortunately the voice that stays in my head is Samuel Pepys so um, I'd be very glad to get rid of that and move on to someone else. <laughs> <laughs> um, one final thing before um, I leave you to the rest of your day and um, just you know one word answer obviously our answer would be Charleston so I'm not going to ask you to recommend that but when people are free to move around and visit a stately home um, after lockdown and after after all this is over and um, where would you suggest Hannah first of all well I have to say what's the manor don't I because <laughs> I because it's our fat way well, you know, it's the house that our family still runs on behalf of the National Trust I would also say Charleston funny enough I, I, I know I'm not supposed to say that and it's not um, for any other reason than I do think it's has it is a particularly magical place in a particularly glorious setting yeah I agree and Julian how about you um, my choice is rather obvious, really, which is Blenheim, because I made a film there, a documentary there, and I found it a much more beguiling house than I'd ever realised when I was just sort of going in with my sixpence, you know. Uh, and, uh, and I did really love it. And I think you're talking about artefacts having their own history and their own story and all of that stuff. Uh, that is a, a house that's very, very rich in all that. But uh, a house that's very enviable, I think, is Belton. Uh, I mean, that's a house you sort of like to wake up and find there'd been a mistake and you were really left it. <laughs> no one wants to be left Blenheim, but, but I would like to be left Belton. Oh, well, 
Julian and Hannah, thank you ever so much for your time today. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to both of you. I'm huge fans of the work that you do and I wish you the very best of luck with everything else that you're doing in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much.